So that is Silver to Rust, All Them Witches on Soho Radio. And I am joined in the studio by Clams Baker of Horn hey, Dusha. Hey, hello, everyone. Thanks hello. for having me, Georgie. <laughs> Thank you for coming in. It's, you know, you literally wrapped the tour last night. Yeah. So this is this is a huge deal. Thank you so much for coming into oh, Soho. It's an absolute like, pleasure. And, and this isn't me putting on my uh, sexy voice. This is <laughs> this is definitely tour voice. The husky, yeah, the husky <laughs> tour yeah. voice. After, you know, however many weeks. Like, yeah. just yeah, about patient. three weeks, I think. Maybe 19 gigs or something like that it's a lot of gigs yeah yeah anywhere that was obviously london we'll talk about the london show because yeah. i came down to that last thursday at kentish town forum but okay, what was the most memorable moment of this tour the, you know not, not to sound like i'm making up a cliche or whatever but every single every single show was literally like an amazing show yeah and the way that we the way that it happened like luckily uh rick disco rick who's our touring agent set it up that we were going to honor all these shows that we were supposed to do be, you know before we had gotten to where we are now and when covid you know came in so we had these little like the smaller ones like maybe 100 cap venues and stuff like that but mm. because we hadn't played in so long really they all serve like an amazing purpose which is essentially like rehearsing or like getting ready for the other ones because Due to the nature of our band, it's really hard to get everyone together. Yeah. So it was like <laughs> it was like starting all over again, like right from the beginning to these. To, to uh, I can't remember the first, the very first place that we played, uh, but it doesn't matter. You know, but the very very first pl place that we played, and it was like wow, it was almost like starting as a new band, and it mm -hmm. was like you know I think it was maybe like a hundred and fifty cap, two hundred cap room or something like that, and it was so intense and so amazing, and it was like okay all the bs that we went through going to get to this it's like yeah. all out the window and this is what we're meant to do and play as a band without sounding too spinal tap or whatever but it was like it, it was like it totally was, yeah and then it just grew and it was really tough and it was really difficult and it was really like you know um real it was like us carrying all of it not to sound like you know prima donnas or whatever but it was like starting you know i was carrying our stuff up three flights of stairs and like towing out at like one in the morning and stuff and us all being in a small splitter van and like obviously partying and doing everything else and all this sort of like you know we're all kind of alpha male in our own ways so like it's like a perfect it could be a perfect storm for like and we're self-managed <laughs> yeah basically yeah but it wasn't and, no, it was and we're self-managed like we all mm -hmm. manage ourselves um due to whatever reason and like so it, it could have been all those things but like the toughness and the tiredness of, of it and also I have to say like for me personally not drinking and stuff like that like I'm not I'm not trying to send out any message with that either anyways mm. but it's just my personal choice and like it all helped and it was like you know I, I have a tendency to waffle on so just stop me when I, <laughs> when I need to but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, each, so there was no like one pressing gig but like my my favorites just like it progressively grew as the end and like last night to me was probably like it was it was the best show ever maybe for me yeah personally it yeah. was like wow like all the nerves out like everything gone it was the end of the it, you know it was the end of that run and we all were just like clicking so good as a band and it was like didn't even have to think it, it was like a dream and it yeah. was like you know it was insane and the crowd was great and then Boom! Got to go home to my to my family and everything else, and yeah. I wake up today. And I'm here with you guys, yeah. with, with Gav and Georgie, <laughs> my like my homies. So it's like, and and everyone in the band says hello. They couldn't make it today for whatever reasons. And yeah, yeah, yeah. They're recovering, but they all like send their love and thanks to Aww. everyone. Well, I'm so glad to have you in. Cause I mean, I've known of I mean, I've known of your music for, for quite a few years. Yeah, we did yeah. that tiny, a little interview. It was a South by Southwest showcase, and That's I right. interviewed I for that. six music, and that must have been after album number two, maybe. Two that was three. three. That oh, was, that was three. Th um, I think so. I think that was when we did Tainted Lunch. Yeah. And then we, we got, luckily, thankfully, we got funded by South by Southwest to go. And we're like, we did it. But I probably did it like, or, or not I, but we did it probably as like, a, not the right way because once again, didn't have management. But like, we just wanted to go out and play and we got some really good gigs. Didn't get like the kind of like all the stuff that people got there to get like you know booking agency in the u.s and all that shit but mm. we did like it all but still good to sort of it was all part of your building yeah process, I guess. and then so. mostly that was the second album you know why that that was whale city actually you're right mm. because because what we did is after we did south by southwest we immediately recorded tainted lunch so you're right sorry yeah. um and and that like served that purpose because we were so tight as a band that we literally came back from there like playing like sometimes three shows a day and just you know i was drinking then and i was very like you know and yeah. we came back and went right in the studio like maybe four days later with dan and then we did tainted lunch which was like 
our most well received album like mm-hmm. through the radio and all that stuff and yeah so it served it served an amazing purpose that way yeah and then here we are with at the hotspot which came out a week ago yeah and um, and yeah you know the london show was just it was sold out it was packed in there the vibe was amazing and talk a bit about this record because this kind of like you were meant to go in the studio with dan carey again weren't you and then yeah. actually plans changed because of covid because you know yeah. that's what we've had to put up with for the last two years but yeah tell me a bit about the gestation of of at the hotspot so that like literally came from just like a really silly thing that how we start stuff with records and it came from uh ben and marley uh ben we call him salt fingers lovecraft and uh marley we call him three piece or the worm you know it's marley Mackey, and he's, yeah. he's a latest edition and they came in and they were literally talking about you know like on the streets you have those hot spot like free wireless things like that, oh yeah, that yeah, are yeah, like, yeah. They're silly. They're not silly, but they're they're like meant for people that like to just go freely charge their phones or like make calls and stuff like that. But what's happened around like mainly New York City, you see, or like probably like Los Angeles or or California, or I mean San Francisco, and sometimes like in London, you'll get this subculture of people that like the people that are actually using those are the people like making drug deals and like the underbellies of I society. See. So okay. it's like it was a funny contrast of this your technical technical technically advanced thing for like this you know, mainly probably to sell advertising to be let's be honest yeah but like but what you get in that is the same sign of same kind of like reoccurring theme that i appreciate and that i love and that makes me excited is like a vision of like 1970s new york city uh um you know times times square yeah where like all the sort of underbelly of the city actually come out and thrive and you know it's not a good or a bad thing there's obviously a lot of bad things stuff like that but i'm i've always been the type of person that like that supports the bad guys in the movies or it's like yeah <laughs> we're we're good people doing bad things maybe i don't know you know like that type of a vibe but um but but the hot spot comes from that about this funny sort of like contrast but then it evolves into a hot spot could be anything it could yeah. be you know between your brain it could be between it could be a party. your thighs it could it could be be whatever, <laughs> whatever you want you know what i mean it could be all over all over anything and that kind of like yeah that 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 that's what it is and this kind of like like blade runner idea of what the future is meant to be and like you know when you uh, i'm talking probably coded or whatever but it's like when you go back and you watch like those movies like escape from new york and they say like what 2000 was supposed to be and it looks like this like you know crazy insane like futuristic city in actuality it's not it's just like a dump it's like the side of the road and there's people laying out there and they're they're doing all kinds of things that what what mm-hmm. humans just generally do in the city yeah and so I take that idea in a long story long and then evolve it into an individual person who might be in a situation where they're bored with their life or they're unhappy with their job or they're kind of towing the line trying to be a good person and mm-hmm. then they just say forget it let's go and then they go to the hot spot and then they do what uh, you know whatever they have yeah. fun yeah so <laughs> I guess and then we dance i guess that, yeah 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 so i don't know if that makes sense <laughs> no but, it does but that's it does. kind of that's kind of where where it is and like the way i do things lyrically a lot of stuff gets lost in translation because i'm very self-centered in that way where it's like my own kind of ideas and it makes sense to me but like i probably miss can or probably make the mistake of not explaining it to a lot of people so a lot of people don't know what that is but i also as a lyricist i like to make things surreal and i like yeah. to make th- I like like people to make up their own ideas without without like telling them what yeah. i'm saying yeah and i like that that's what I, that's one thing i really love about the warm do shirt outfit oh, thank you. is that there is that there's that sense it's just yeah you it kind of go along with it but you don't anyone yeah. can make their own assumptions on on it but it's it's just it's cool it's kind of like it's sort of like a deep dive into yeah into your mind and like lots of like i don't know colorful cool references and it's just it's just a cool yeah. vibe with the sort of like the disco post disco funk kind of sleazy edge to it musically yeah. it just it all comes together in this really great well, fusion, I appreciate I that. Think. and that's what we try to do we just try to make it like you know you can you, some people could look at it as bad some people could look at it as good mm-hmm. at the end of the day we're not trying to preach any words we're just trying to do good trying to make people feel good and try to just let that go and and that's yeah. all people you know what i mean that's like we say love songs for losers and unwanted you know what i mean it's <laughs> like but we don't support any of that crap like people harming people or doing the wrong stuff once again not trying to sign cliche or trying to sound like anything else but mm-hmm. we do not support that we are very safe and like 
another thing we say is like the only people that are harmed in making them our music are ourselves yeah so, so it's like so that's fine yes do, do you know what i mean and that's totally. and that's all good and and but you know like i said like growing up i always liked the bad guys in the movie you know what i mean but i also you know like i always like that sort of like that that feeling of kind of like you know the nice guys doing good guys doing bad things maybe yeah. when you say as long as it's not like harming people i will yeah. not support any of that mm-hmm. or any of and once again i'm not trying to sound like i'm saying the right thing it's yeah. just it's just what it is yeah good vibes only and this is i think we should play a track because we've got a few tracks from the album that i want to get through mm-hmm. uh, we should play wild flowers okay is there anything like because this mentions the hot spot so it's sort yeah. of like you know just, so that long-winded explanation yeah, is essentially is, is, is essentially that okay yeah. let's play it and then we'll talk more okay i'll be talking more with clams baker of warm douche after this so that's Wildflowers by Warm Dusha and I'm joined by Clams Baker, the front hey, man, hey. songwriter, extraordinaire. I, what I really loved about your show <laughs> was the the move. You've got some, you've got <laughs> yeah. a lot of moves, Clams, oh, but you. the running on the spot move. Thank I love you. that. Uh, yeah, that comes from uh, in my in my in my old days, a long, long time ago. I used to box, and that was my like. Uh, another, that was your, like getting ready. Yeah, yeah as a passion of mine. Like I was, I was like a you know, I'm I'm super into boxing, and like now as it is, I'm not a violent person, but I just I always, love it too. I always loved it. Yeah, I yeah. actually fought in the Junior Olympics as as a as a, Did you? As a four, yeah, yeah yeah I got knocked out in the second round. <laughs> And luckily, and I realized I wasn't a boxer very quickly. But but that, it comes from it comes from that sort of like ah oh, you know like the psych up yeah, do, do, yeah you know what I mean like like um it, it comes from that and yeah. I still do like I'll still train and stuff like that like mm-hmm. getting ready and I and I use that mentality of like it's one of the scariest things you'll ever do in your entire life it's one of the most not like natural human thing to do to like yeah. go into a ring and get beaten up mm-hmm. and like but but in order to face that. It, yeah. like, I apply that to everything I do in life. Like I never wanted to be a singer in a front bit, never ever. Yeah. I knew I wanted to be in music, but I, I went to school for music business, like weird weirdly enough. Mm-hmm. But I use that that sort of mentality to like fight the demons and yeah. so it's like, wow, like getting yeah, getting the energy going. I, go, I got the, really into it and then I tried to go sparring and then I got punched in the face <laughs> twice <laughs> by these two really scrappy guys. I was like, come on, like yeah. that, like I do kind of need my face <laughs> yeah. for like life, you know. It's a quick li- rather not, you know, like have a broken face. Yeah. Thanks it's a quick dose much. of reality, right? Have you, it, was but like, it was so good. But then the pandemic happened and then I just like yeah. yeah. You know. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things. Like it's, um, but I do want to get back into it. I've, I really, I, I feel well, the same. Maybe we'll go. Like maybe we'll go to the gym. Me and Gavin and Claudia will all go and we'll have a good, like, have a good session. He's six foot five, though, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Might be, like, you know, a little bit. You know, yeah. But, yeah, you and I, maybe. Yeah, 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 we'll get in there. Um, so, talk, talking about this record at the Hotspot, which just came out, and uh, you made it, so you made it with two absolute legends, Joe Goddard and Al, jo- Al Doyle from Hot Chip. That's right. And um, yeah, Dan Carey couldn't do it. He got COVID and plans changed, whatever. But what what did you feel that that dynamic brought to the record? Because it was kind of a new thing for you. You hadn't not worked with Dan, right? Since I hadn't. Yeah. Beginning. So the very first record we did was with Luke and Liam of Trash Mouth. And yeah. That, and that was like a literally an improvised album on the spot with when Saul and Jack were both in the band and we all did it together, like not even knowing what we were going to doing, going to be doing. And then the second album, which was Well City. Dan came and saw us. We were actually playing a house party for Mika Levy. Mm. With, like shouts to her. Like she's one oh, of my. I make a chew in the shapes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And we were playing her house party, and Dan was there because he was. I think he was working with her. Yeah. So he saw us doing that and saw this like really stripped down, like weird thing that we were doing because it was in someone's house on like a little pair of speakers, and he captured that, and then he wanted to apply that to basically what, what we were recording in the studio and capture that live element. So we just continued to work with him. So working with him was a direct way of capturing that stuff, which is live. And so we didn't know what was going to happen with Joe and Al because obviously they come from the more electronic, mm-hmm. more poppy, more kind of you know polished thing. But I knew personally in my heart that it was going to be perfect. And I knew that we needed to do that and evolve as a band. And they're obviously, well, not obviously, but they were the, all the sort of things of like the underlying worries of, oh, is it going to be... Is it going to be like that? Is it going to be too different? Is it going to be too... But it wasn't. It was perfect. And yeah. it's like, you know, there's some things that you sacrifice still with anything that you wouldn't have gotten with 
that we wouldn't have gotten with them that we would have got with Dan. But there's a lot of stuff that we got with them that we never would have gotten Dan with Dan, which is mainly like time, mainly going back and doing things a little bit not so raw. And and so for me, it progressed personally it was a, it was a, it was like a progression that we needed needed mm. to have yeah. but it was also the same element of Dan like where we all recorded in a room as well so it was like it was like it it, it wasn't weird for me personally at all it was like it was like an, it was a weird like dream and, and I gotta say the reason why that came about was because of two of my most favorite people in the world which are Igor Lima Cavalera yeah and I was working with them and Joe and Al on another thing, like an electronic project. And I was literally in the studio with them doing that when I got the news that we couldn't do it with Dan. And they were like, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah. So it was like this so weird... Was super easy, natural, kind of serendipitous yeah. thing. It was like fate. It was like, you know, it was, it was like it was a weird thing to happen like that. And like I said, thank you to Igor and Lima, especially for making that happen. That was great. It was great. Yeah. And so writing sessions, so you did this like over the lockdown year, right? So yeah. how was writing sessions then? Did you, did you guys, did you get in a room with the other bands or was it more just sending stuff back and forth? We, we all got together and like... We, it was all to do with the thank another thank you to Domino uh, yes. Publishing to, to David Donald, which I'm a, I'm a publisher for them. We're not on their label, but w- within that, when you when you sign to them as publisher, you get to use their writing room, which is like this awesome place in Wandsworth, which mm-hmm. is like it's it looks like you're in a house, you're in like a basement of a house, and it's got a lot of history there. I think with the Rolling Stones and the Who and like all kinds of like weird musical history. I think don't call me, on that, but there's some kind of like thing. But anyways we had access to that. And so when it came out during COVID that you could work in a kind of contained environment, we utilized that as a way to not just make music, but also just to socialize because it was yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like you, you can well, only you take so. You've, yeah. You've been sort of stripped of that right in a way from, yeah, not uh, yeah, from just in your house for months on end. Exactly. <laughs> and like, as people, weirdly enough, we get sick of each other. So or not weirdly enough, we get sick of each other so often because we're playing so much that like normally like getting together in a week everyone would be like nah, like you know what I mean like nah sorry I got something to do <laughs> you're but, like yes get me to this <laughs> get me yeah. there right now and then get out of the house and then we just wrote the we wrote like probably 20 songs in that in that period of time and then I stripped them down and, and chose the ones that we have on the album that you hear mm-hmm. now and and like we made like really polished demos together in that space and then and then shopped it and luckily uh thank you to Pella Union and Simon he had, like immediately just by hearing the demos and they were so different from what you would hear mm. now he was like oh my god yeah I want to sign that and he was the first one to say it and it was the first one that we like really like, okay it's a no brainer we're not even going to try to like get other people anymore like or talk to other people anymore it's like mm. he was so into it that we're like yeah it's a no brainer yeah and Twitching in the Kitchen, which we're going to play next, is I saw a, a great video for it. But that, I think, yeah, watching the video was actually the first time I heard the track. Right. And then for the best part of two weeks, <laughs> I just had it in my head. Yeah. I'm twitching in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. It is, it's like outrageously catchy. Oh, thank you. That's great in a good way. I don't mean that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So catchy. How did it come about? And like, that what came about from it? Adam, Quicksand, yeah. and I together. And um, both, you know, admiration, obvious devos, and obviously, uh, you know, an obvious sort of thing, or at least us and everything. And it literally came from us being, you know, up at everyone had left, and we were in the writing room, and we were basically twitching in the writing room because we'd been up so late, and you know, like and just doing yeah. doing what we were doing. And, and then he had the he had the idea of the song, and I was like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like four. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm twitching in the kitchen, man. And I'm like, oh, Jesus! Someone must have made a song like called "Twitching in the Kitchen." But I guess they had. There's different versions of yeah. it. I think an old like soul song, like switching or something. Like, but we had no idea of that, and it just came as like a really funny kind of inside joke of like us being there, and then it just it just it just happened, and then. Um, Adam, I had all these ideas. It's kind of like a bittersweet thing for him because he had all these ideas of how the the song was going to come about and how he wanted to do it. So he had to sacrifice a lot with it, the way it actually came out. But actually, like no one would ever know that. And it came out really good. And I got to say shouts to Quicksand because he he came up with the video concept. He came up with the song. Obviously, we all do it together and we make it our own. Mm -hmm. But like that was the he he was he is the brainchild of that whole thing. And then the lyrics came obviously from us from that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It's a banger. Thank you very much. Let's hear it. Thanks and to Adam. <laughs> Quick sand. Shout out Adam. And we'll chat more after this. Who's my number? <laughs> Twitching in the kitchen, and that is Warm Dusha, and I am joined by the front man, hey, hey. Clam Steaker. You're joined by everyone too. They're, me, they're, in the, they're all here, but they're not here. Yeah. They're, they're in their beds listening, I'm sure. Here in spirit. Yes. Um, and so, I mean, that's yeah, that's such a banger. You also like you. I mean, you spoke a bit about it because this is the first album with Bella Union, mm-hmm. and bit of a switch up of production just generally like a bit of a not a reset but just oh, yeah. a kind of like fresh 100% reset yeah, yeah. yeah. but in, in and in a, in a really like wonderful way did you feel on Thursday at the London gig did you feel like that was kind of a a moment like okay because you said on stage you're like we've been doing this for years and you have you've been around you know four albums in now and it's like really feeling like a lot more people know about you and it's just it's kind of kicking into a new gear maybe yeah 100 percent. it's like definitely all that and it was like it was like it's always like a big reset because we had to reset in a time when we were really blowing up and for whatever reason you know we don't have a big social media presence we don't you know we, we're not that's not like sort of our thing so it's like mm. you'll look at other bands that probably have been going the same amount of us and you'll see like oh god they look like you know what i mean like they, they have this this sort of like big following or whatever but where our following is most importantly for us is live and like everybody sort of knows us but then nobody knows us as well so it's like this mm-hmm. weird kind of like thing and yeah and this was like a, a reset like new logos new image new producers new um, label new everything but all the same from what we do as well and what we have been doing like that that vibe stays the same and where it's most important is live on stage and it's not always easy getting there. And I think a lot, a lot of people, um, like media-wise and stuff like that, they don't get us. They don't know if we're serious. They don't know if we're making jokes. They don't know if we're saying bad things. They don't know if we're saying good things. And so I think it's now starting to get get like um, not so lost in translation. And I think, like thankfully, you know that that's that we're we're starting to see the benefits of that now, mm. and like more, you know, what I mean, like, and a lot of times to our own fault, we would do interviews and stuff like that, and we'd say so many like inside jokes that we look like we were maybe taking the piss out of people or something like mm. that, but it wasn't that way at all. It's just like we like to have a laugh, and and but on the inside of that, we're so serious, like everybody like once again, shout out to the band, every single one of them are like. That's where that's where our confidence and swagger comes from because it's like I know that every single one of them to whatever faults they have are the best musicians I could ever be surrounded with. You know yeah. what I mean? From top to bottom. And it doesn't mean that they're like, you know, classically trained or a music but it's the vibe and the soul of what everyone does. Mm-hmm. And it's like when it comes together all of us as a band and it makes sense and that's what you saw at the forum yeah it did it really did and that's when you see like we're doing things that a lot of people will probably say like oh you guys are selling out you're being like this or that but I, I do not give a shit you know what mm-hmm. I mean it's like it's like you know we know where we come from and everything else but like I knew even doing then I knew this is not where I will where we will stay like we deserve to be on the big stage we deserve mm-hmm. to be seen in front to, by as many people as possible because regardless of what we do we stick to what we stay and what we believe in and what we believe in and what we do we know is a good thing at the end of the day Definitely. and if that means we gotta like you know what I mean like straighten up or, or, or polish up to some people I don't care I don't really care how we're, how we're perceived by those types of that type of thing. So I don't know if I'm answering the question potentially, yeah, no, but but like yeah, it was definitely a step up, and it was definitely calculated step up in my own head in knowing, but always knowing that we, we should be on a stage like that, and like yeah. the things like the logo, like thanks to Gavin and Nando, mm. and things like that, like having this like idea that we couldn't normally afford to do, mm. but like always having that vision, like but only being allowed to do, to play on a small stage where you couldn't maybe make that stuff happen. Yeah. So it's about like picking and choosing battles and then taking so much crap of, uh, uh, like to get to where you're going because we might not get accepted. By, we might not be media darlings or whatever. Well, like nothing that, but, comes easy, does it really? Yeah. Music, you know, it can be really, really hard and then it's like all that work builds up to this point and then it starts to pay off and that's what we're seeing. Like, you know, yeah. all that hard work totally. has got you to this point and you should be doing huge tours and yeah, I mean, you are, you know, you're going to be at Glastonbury, which is a huge thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, we to be a great asked to play. Yeah, are you doing John Peel? 10. No, we're doing the park stage. I mean, the park, oh, but my, at even four, better. Four p.m. on a Sunday. That's going to so be. So it's like it's really scary because yeah. we're also playing at four a.m. at the Shangri La. Okay. The night before, and Ooh. I'm also doing a gig <laughs> with Paranoid London at like one a.m. 
the next day. You know what I mean? So it's like, but 100% eyes on the prize. That like, will be, if if the sun comes out, 4 p.m. on the park on Sunday will be. Oh, I hope so. Potentially like one of those, like something you'll never ever forget for as long as you live. Like, I really hope so. And my daughter is going to be joining us there and singing. And also the witherer, who's the guy who makes the noise. And he's sort of like ominous guy that just stands there and does like <laughs> the stuff. He's, his daughter is going to be joining us because she was on Twitching in the Kitchen as well, which will make three generations of Wallys. Funny enough, that's his last name <laughs> is it? at Glastonbury. But his father, uh, Steve Wally, uh, is one of the original people of Glastonbury. And Quinn, the Witherer himself, was the first person to ever DJ with Darren Emerson at, at Glastonbury at the tent or whatever tent that they were in. I don't, like I say, I, I don't, I, I always get things a little bit mixed up, but he was the first, like when, when that happened with Darren Emerson, he DJed with him as a 14 year old and he used to hate going to Glastonbury, but his dad would like, they're old yeah, hippies take him along, yeah. and they'd, they'd go in like a camper van and they'd leave him <laughs> and he'd, he'd cry and he'd be like, oh, I don't want to be here. But now he loves it. And now like, you know, fingers crossed, everything goes right. Mm. Um, she will be the third generation of Wally on there joining on the stage with my daughter. And um, so, like, I'm not going to let any of the other stuff interfere with, with that one. That yeah, yeah, moment. yeah. And, and we should mention as well, because, yeah, your daughter joined you on stage at the forum. She did, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how old is she, like, 14? She's 17. 15? 17. She's 17. And, and she's, like, we're just talking off air, but we're, she's got a beautiful voice, definitely follows, yeah. in, follows in the footsteps. Oh, musical. yeah. Musical. Her mom, too. Her, mom, her mom's in Meat Raffle, <laughs> yes. the bass player Meat Raffle. So she comes from a musical family. And my twin daughters, right, you know, were there in the audience filming. They got to see everything. And they are artists, like, insane artists artists as well one's a writer one's one's a illustrator or whatever you want to say like very high q high iq kids and so it's like it was just a beautiful moment you know what i mean they got to see you know what i mean their thing is not music but they're just as much a part of her journey yeah has all you know all together and they're all just like amazing yeah and so yeah i'm blessed yeah and great for her to get to yeah to do that like it's it's all just you know starts yeah starts it yeah basically you hopefully know. they'll all be accountants you know what i mean yeah. hopefully they'll, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they'll go and be lawyers or something yeah yeah or yeah, yeah. i need support i need yeah. financial support when i'm older <laughs> change my diapers <laughs> Now let's talk about another track off the record. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Baby Toe Joe, okay. another of my favorites. Yeah, that's one that uh, Mr. Salt Fingers brought in, and you know it, it's pretty much self-explanatory. But it's just a song about toxic back masculinity and the, and the the irony between those or of those like really big sort of like you know muscle bound men that you meet that like everyone's like really attracted to, but then they can't deliver for whatever obvious reasons yeah. that you can you can you can get, <laughs> and it's just a funny thing about that and like just a really fun nice song to do big uh like kind of soulful and kind of like another background where i come from and mm. and uh salt fingers brought that to it because he knows like jimmy like james brown's like that, that song has nothing to do with james brown but it's like that that was what he james brown seeing him when i was a young kid yeah my mom and her boyfriend took me to see and that like wow. inspired me to be a musician i saw him with the uh, um the jb's in this like really small 200 cap like tent no from way. in cape cod where i grew up and yeah. it was like i got to meet him afterwards and all that stuff and it was like you know so 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 ben knows like that's like uh, coming from my background as weird as it is as being like this white kid from cape cod or whatever but that's like that's like an inspiring you know thing and and so he knew like if i bring that and then i do my spin on the soul thing which is like just it's just about people that i would know that i would never name that like that i know that that like might look like these adonises but they're actually <laughs> really like toxic males and they're not nice to women and they're not like you know what i mean and they're like yeah so that that that's, that's it without okay. good so you can you can you can go with whatever you want to go with it out there but yeah it's a fun song about it about a about a about a not so fun situation and and people always figure that stuff out with those people in the end and it's about their frustration really and the funniness of like <laughs> doing whatever they can to to maintain that big strong man but actually everyone knows they're just like Little paper tigers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's say it. This is Baby Toe Joe, Warm Dusha on Soy Radio. 
Baby Toe Joe, and that is from the new Warm Dusha record at yeah. the Hot Spa, which is out now for your buying pleasure. Get that stuff, Spring. Get us the number one. Yeah, vinyl a bit. We've got to wait a bit, right? Vinyl in July, apparently. Yeah. Due to all this Brexit bullcrap and, and everything else. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like a whole like delay on all vinyls. Isn't yeah, there? It's like yeah. it's been a right. Right shit show. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it will be coming out in vinyl. It's coming out in vinyl. You do coloured vinyl and things like Yeah, like it. an insane package and within it like this awesome comic book by Russell Taysom Ooh. who's done this like kind of like a throwback to to like um you know stay in school kids like don't mm-hmm. but but to do with a hot spot and about like a, a, a really straight laced boy going to school and then getting strayed to the hot spot and then going to like this really sexually you know like this crazy nightclub and then you know, taking acid and going like into this whole thing. So it's a really cool, but it's limited to those. They might even be sold out by now, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks to Russell for doing that. Nice. And Puss Magazine, who, who linked it up, which is like this really weird German magazine that, that that's only hardcover. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, I feel like Warm Dusha fans, like people that are really into your band, will definitely want the physical thing. They yeah, yeah. already all pre ordered it. They're already they're sold out, I think. Way ahead of me. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> and, yeah. So, um, Clams, in terms of, we've had album number four, you know, you're just basking in the glory of it now. Yes. You, you must feel that, um, what, have you had a lot of messages and stuff from fans just being like, we really dig the new album? We've had a lot, like, it's, it's hard to sort through them, once again, because we're self-managed, so it's like, I, can, mm. I, I, I go through as many as I can, like, in, on, online and stuff like that. It's not, like, overwhelming at all, but there's a lot of amazing response from, from old fans and new fans, and, like, people just starting to get us, and, like, it, it's been so nice, it's been really good to get that. Yeah. So where do you go on album number five? Any plans? Oh, we've already been like it's practically written already. Like we, there was this like I don't want to give too much of a, of it away, but the, the, it started from another like really funny theme, also from Ben and Marley. Okay, about the idea of like. <laughs> I'll kind of give it away, but it's this idea of having like these kind of hunger games okay. in the world, but it's but rather than ice hockey, it's called rice hockey, <laughs> and you have like these big goons supporting supporting different p- different countries in the world, all trying to play like ice hockey for the one little grain of ice, <laughs> like these big like Canadian dudes with like no teeth, like, and then the, the the winner who gets the grain of rice like gets to plant the rice and then feed their country. Okay, yeah, yeah. love w- it without giving too much away, love but it. but it's already kind of written. 